We tend to think of the big stuff, the guns, engines, boilers, even the hull and armor when looking at the systems on Battleship Texas, but what about the less visible ones, like instrumentation and control? It isn't until we look at them more closely that we can really appreciate the incredible complexity of this 110-year-old battleship. So pull your geek hats down around your ears. We're about to take a detailed look at interior communications. Hundreds of people have passed the room while taking hard hat tours. Those who looked in saw a room full of equipment without realizing just how important it was. Before we go there, let me take 23 seconds to encourage you to support the repair and restoration work currently taking place on Battleship Texas. You can do that by purchasing merchandise from their store or by taking one of the dry dock tours that are being given on many Sundays through January 2024. You can go to the store or learn more about the tours by using links you'll find in this video's description. As its name suggests, interior communications included systems that support the ability to communicate throughout the ship, but it did far more than that. As we look at all of the devices, it will become obvious just how complex and important it was to the ship. One thing the room handled was a lot of electrical power. We've seen the big dynamos that supplied 120 volt direct current to switchboards that distributed it through the ship to energize lighting and motors of all kinds and sizes. However, it could not be used to power hundreds of devices and circuits dedicated to communications and control and data signals that required alternating current. That was generated using DC motors to turn generators that produced AC power, thus the name motor generators or MG sets. Scores of them are scattered around the ship where they sit next to the devices they power. However, there was a concentrated need for alternating current to power large, complex systems in a protected environment. That was the job of interior communications. We can see by looking at an interior profile of the ship that the compartment is heavily protected on the first platform level. It lies beneath two armored decks and behind and beneath an armored citadel created by the ship's armored belt and casemate armor. It's positioned close to the forward dynamo room that served as its power source, beneath main radio room that drew power from it, and directly above the main battery plotting room that completely depended upon it. To get to the compartment, we must descend to the third deck and take the starboard ammunition passage that runs along the drying rooms and above the boiler rooms. We'll step through a door that penetrates a major bulkhead, where a door just beyond it and to the left leads to a trunk that will take us down. At the bottom of the first ladder, we can see a door that leads into interior communications. I am in interior communications. It's on the uh, first platform level. Uh, off the trunk leading down to main battery plot. Uh, I am currently looking at the forward bulkhead as we sweep around the room. There's the starboard bulkhead with uh, controllers and uh, small motor generator sets. As we sweep around the room there's the aft bulkhead. It has more control equipment and then also distribution and control equipment for all of the uh, electrical systems for the main battery directors and plotting room down below. Here's a switchboard. In the center of the space is a modern air conditioner used to cool main battery plot installed about 12 years ago. Here's two large AC motor generator sets and then the back of the control panel for those. As we can see, there's the main disconnects, power disconnects for both generators. And then here's all the uh, control and synchronizing equipment. The ship started life with little need for alternating current. However, that need grew tremendously as a result of her modernization in 1925 when many of her instruments and circuits were replaced. Most of Texas's original 1914 instruments ran on direct current that frequently lost calibration due to voltage fluctuations or even brief interruptions in the ship's power supply. Those problems were largely solved in 1925 with the introduction of self-synchronizing equipment and circuits, also called Selsons by General Electric. They had the ability to remain accurate during power fluctuations and automatically recalibrate themselves when power was restored after an outage. However, they required alternating current to accomplish that. Let's take a closer look at the equipment by starting with items in the center of the room. From there, we can work around the sides to see the different types of equipment and discuss the work that each does. 
The first thing we have to do is address the elephant in the room, a modern window unit air conditioner installed to cool the main battery plotting room that lies beneath this space. Its plywood plenums and flexible ducts are in the way of everything and are pretty unsightly. In its defense, it was installed in a manner that allows its removal at any time without leaving evidence that it was ever there. There are also two big MG sets that take up a lot of the remaining center space. They are large general power supplies that provided much of the AC power required by the radio receivers found in main radio along with other equipment. These are 1941 upgrades that supplemented what had been previously used to serve systems installed during her 1925 modernization. The fact that there are two of them created a problem when they were combined to create a single AC power source. When in operation, their voltage and current output swung from positive to negative and back to positive 60 times a second as seen with their sine waves. When wired together, the two sine waves must precisely match one another to prevent equipment damage and to achieve maximum efficiency. This controller board was built to do exactly that. It started and brought the AC generator power online, then synchronized their two outputs. We can see the large load brake solenoids and arc chutes at the bottom, along with load sensing relays that provided overload and short circuit protection for the motor inputs and generator outputs. Dials and lights above them were used to adjust motor speeds to match outputs. From there, the combined power was fed to the big distribution panel on the opposite side of the room. Let's now look back at the door in the forward bulkhead and to its right. Close to the bulkhead starboard corner are three narrow enclosures lined up side by side that go a long way to help the room earn its name. They are the major controls and amplifiers for the ship's 1MC and 2MC intercoms. 1MC is the general ship-wide intercom that could be heard throughout the ship. 2MC is the engineering intercom system that communicated to major engineering spaces such as the engine, boiler, dynamo, and steering rooms. Tucked between the amplifier and other equipment on the adjoining bulkhead is a switch panel containing rows of switches. These distributed the amplifier outputs to groups of speakers called reproducers located throughout the ship. Hidden in the corner are two very old MG sets and their controllers. Their legend plates indicate that they were not only produced in 1918, they served as power supplies for two range keepers. Range keepers are analog computers capable of providing continuous firing solutions and were absolute game changers for U.S. long-range gunnery. Texas holds a special place in history with them. The very first Ford Mark I range keeper prototype was tested on the ship in 1916. That special device still exists and is now part of the U.S. Naval Academy's collection. The tests were very successful, so it was modified to be more durable and easier to operate. The resulting device was then renamed Ford Mark I Mod I. Two of those production units were installed on the ship in 1918 and fed by the generators we see here. Those devices were eventually replaced by Mark I Mod 11s that served on the ship until her retirement. Placed in the center of early old-school MG sets and controllers is a more modern motor speed controller used on a large 40 horsepower driven generator. On the bulkhead behind the big controller are two rather nondescript boxes. These are wind direction and wind intensity transmitters. They received voltages from a wind vane and an ammonometer mounted to the ship's foremast that looked a little like this. The two boxes converted the voltages into signals that were used by apparent wind speed and direction receivers mounted in the navigator space, navigation bridge, combat information center, and main battery plotting rooms where they were used in gunnery calculations and to navigate the ship. As we move to the right, we see two even older MG sets. Their legend plates describe them as gun firing circuits one and two. These provided primary power to two different switchboards and main battery plotting rooms that were used to select which 5-inch or 14-inch guns would be fired in single or multi-gun salvos. The MG sets and their controllers are dated 1911, making it highly likely they are part of the ship's original system. A powered telephone system existed on the ship as early as 1914 that was powered by this MG set and controller labeled Telephone Talking. The system was modified and grew throughout the ship's career to take in a large number of locations, even including officers' berthing quarters. Turning the corner to the aft bulkhead, we'll skip over some junction boxes to take a look at a fused distribution panel that served the ship's pitometer system. The pitometer is the ship's speedometer. Its sensor was mounted in a well in the bottom of the hull where it measured the flow of water across it to determine ship speed. 
A close look at its switches show the panel controlled signals to 13 different locations where speedometers called pitometer logs or simply pit logs were used for navigation, combat information, and by gunnery where it was included in firing solutions for the 14-inch guns. We'll skip past the white storage cabinet and look at a gray bulkhead mounted switch box. This box distributed and controlled power to several locations around the ship that allowed them to sound either general or chemical attack alarms. Behind the center cover were the wiring terminals and fuses that protected each circuit. Beyond the alarm panel in the room thermostat is a gray enclosure that sits above an open switch panel that provided power and signal to the engine tachometer system. If you watched one of my previous videos, you saw gear transducers sitting above the prop shafts that were spun by gear rings mounted on the shafts to generate voltages. Those were transmitted to the gray enclosure where they were converted to a usable signal. A look inside the box allows us to see pretty classic wiring layout for a self-synchronizing AC circuit. From there, output signals were sent to tachometers located in the engine rooms, navigation bridge, and conning tower. We can now turn the corner to the port bulkhead where we'll see a very large distribution board that dominates the entire wall. The panel serves as the point where incoming power was measured, switched, and split into a large number of fuse protected AC circuits. The far left section consists of large transfer relays at the top used to switch power sources. The lower switches distributed DC power to the motors on a number of MG sets including those for phone and gun firing circuits. To the right of that are fuses and switches that distributed the AC outputs. In the center are meters and large rotary switches used to monitor AC power and switch between alternate sources. Below that are switches organized into three groups. Navigation circuits that are always on when underway, fire control circuits that are on only during general quarters, and operating circuits that remain on at all times. The far right end of the panel contains circuit protection and selector switches used for some announcing circuits. Also, there are ones for the ship's engine order telegraphs and rudder angle indicators that connect between the navigation bridge, armored conning tower, and engine rooms. We can then turn the corner to the forward bulkhead and back to the door where we started. To its immediate left is one last panel that routes incoming three-phase AC power from large MG sets through transfer switches and diffused knife switches that controlled output to a number of AC loads. These ranged from steering telegraphs to 3-inch gun fuse setters to emergency power for VHF radios, gyro compasses, and even anti-aircraft announcing and ceasefire circuits. So there you have it. If for no other reason, we can see by the length of this video that the room was pretty complicated and served a wide variety of critical functions. If there was ever a major interruption of functions in this room, ship operations would be compromised to the point of making it impossible for her to effectively communicate, navigate, and fight. As always, thank you for your interest in my videos. We'll continue to occasionally post new ones as we find and pull together videos, photos, and information that shed light on the ship's less visible and largely forgotten features and systems.